Okay. So me... you really, I think it's better to read the Christmas biography before they finish. Sure. Uh, let me just get the recording started. Oh, it's already started. Um, yeah, okay. So, yes, uh, we are recording and we are live, ready to go. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody, to a, uh, the theme uh, of our next talk the expansion of Latin American science fiction. 1920 to 1960. And we have two wonderful speakers with us today who are very knowledgeable on this subject. And the first is Rachel Haywood, who is Associate Professor of Spanish and Portuguese at Iowa State. Her work on early and golden age Latin American science fiction has appeared in publications such as Cambridge History of SF, Revista Ibero Americana. Science Fiction Studies, Hispania, and the Collection of Parabolas of Science Fiction, uh, or L, Portuguese, Cartografia para a Ficção Científica Mundial, uh, Latin American Science Fiction Theory of Practice. She is co editor of the Travelation and the book series Studies in Global Science Fiction for Paul Day McMillan and serves on the editorial boards of Science Studies, the Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts, Alambique, and the Bloomsbury series on fantasy, and Bloomsbury, uh, Bloomsbury series on fantasy. She is a contributing editor for the Latin American Online Cyclopedia of Science Fiction and author of The Emergence of Latin American Science Fiction, published by Wesley in 2011, and her new provisionally titled uh, book uh, will be Latin American Science Fiction in the Space Age. Rachel, thank you so much. I didn't say anything else. <laughs> uh, my, my talk today is uh, changing my title just a little bit uh, from Utopian Universe and from in Latin American science fiction just four years past the story. So I think you're going to get about a quarter of the story. So I'm just calling it El Caso Cañero. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank Stephen Tobin for the wonderful work he has done to make this symposium possible. And likewise, many thanks to all the departments and entities at UCLA who supported this symposium and are present here today. Now, Miguel Ángel and I have been tasked with representing the history of speculative fiction in Latin America. I particularly liked the way Stephen framed it in an email as new scholarship on the SF of the past, or basically the future of the genre's past. <laughs> is Latin American SF as a field of study has grown exponentially since I started my dissertation just over two decades ago. But even as fans, authors, and scholars retro label the pace, we find there's still more to discover about the history of the genre in Latin American countries. My current project, provisionally titled Latin American uh, Science Fiction of the Space Age, focuses on the golden age of Latin American SF, which spans roughly the mid-1950s to the 70s. Besides my interest in how Latin America experienced and represented the space race era, the inspiration for this book uh, came to my curiosity about works I was consistently hearing described as pivotal and influential. And so, of course, I picked just a few, the only way that now comes from the and it comes from the espacio and for publishing phenomena that helped establish and extend the reach of the genre in various Latin American countries, such as the Argentine Magazine Masashka and uh, genre publishing house in Brazil, GFP. Uh, the project also grew out of my work on uh, 19th century uh, Latin American SF, which I published as a where I conclude that early works of Latin American SF did not form the foundations of uninterrupted national SF tradition for writers in the mid and late 20th century. This next book is an effort to explore what did. So today I'm going to talk about part of chapter one, uh, a sort of prequel chapter that looks at works written in the years surrounding World War II. In the 1940s, 19th century science fiction influences rub shoulders with 20th century global concerns and more recent SF themes as we move forward towards the genre SF of the Golden Age. To be clear, by genre SF and Golden Age SF, I mean what Mark Rose calls a generically self-conscious phase in which texts are based on the now explicit form. 
in the transitional moment of the 1940s, we're still in the prior preparation phase that Rose <laughs> is in. Describes as combining and transforming earlier forms, the genre complex assembles, and the idea of the genre's existence gradually appears. The heart of the chapter are the utopias and dystopias that emerge from World War II, the catalyst for both the space race world and the nuclear age. So we're going to skip past uh, the first part of the, the chapter and uh, the dystopias, sorry. Uh, and here are all the utopias you're not going to hear about. Um, Today, I'm going to focus on the work of the earliest Latin American utopist of World War II, Mexican writer Diego Canillo. So, this is the first iteration of this research and will not be the last, so your questions and comments will be particularly welcome. <laughs> Diego Canillo was a student of a well known Mexican architect, Guillermo Sadler. Miguel Angel Fernandez Delgado has described Canillo in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction as one of the most important authors in all of Mexico. SF. And he further notes that of the four important SF novels published in Mexico in the 1940s, three were Cañero's. I would add that of the Latin American writers of science fictional works in this decade, Cañero, along with Jerónimo Montaigne of Brazil, has one of the clearest visions of how the genre can be used to represent Latin American perspectives most effectively. When considering Cañero's three science fictional works, it's helpful to look at them in the order they were written rather than the order they were published. So, and my I am the graphics department of the ghost. Uh, we go from La Noche al Museo del Día to El Reperico El Nueve to Paloma Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. And here I'll give you the dates a little bit better. Um, let's see where we go. So all three works share a number of common elements uh, that you are, that evolve over time to reflect changing national and international reality. All three begin as dystopias and end as utopias, or at least with professions of optimism about the future. All, as Javier Ortiz puts it, portray a society whose well-being is in good measure a result of taking responsibility for past errors. These errors center around three unfinished wars. On an international level, either the Spanish Civil War or World War II was being fought at the time of writing, and the novels reflect the changing imperialisms or imperial intentions with respect to Mexico on the part of Spain, the U.S., and Germany. But the conflict underlying all three works is the figure to the unfinished Mexican Revolution, which had ostensibly ended in 1920. For Pañero, the central problem behind Mexico's woes in the 1930s and 40s was that revolutionary goals had still not been achieved. Finally, all three works contain a science fictional novel, off reading machine, a time traveling manuscript, and a time machine. Through insight or hindsight, each novel series serves to corroborate Pañero's interpretation of events to confirm the efficacy of these proposed solutions. However, despite the use of these three largely mechanical novels and the fact that all of the novels very much reflect contemporary concerns, 19th century science fictional influences are overt throughout Cañero's work, and the novels themselves are not always deployed in particularly science fictional ways. So in content and style, as well as time period, Cañero's work is poised to see early and genre as <laughs> So, La Noche Anuncia el Día, and my translations are, are mostly on my slides, uh, since I promised to speak in English. Um, in the frame story of La Noche Anuncia el Día, two expat Latin American acquaintances, Jose Mendieta and the Señor X, uh, run into each other in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Mendieta tells Mr. X about his political misadventures that ostensibly took place in the fictional Latin American country of La Paz, or peace, mm -hmm. uh, though the true setting of this novel is recognized by one and all, Mexico. Although it was written prior to the main time period that concerns me in the book, this novel provides an early example of how Cañero's work covers between two years of science fiction, a first introduction to his critiques of post-revolutionary Mexico, a baseline for his views on Northern imperialism, and an early illustration of his utopian aspirations for his country. Jose Mendieta had been the personal secretary to wealthy businessman Antonio Coutinho, and Mendieta relates the story of the rise and fall of his former employer centered around his possession of a thought reading uh, machine, our noble. Coutinho had received the plans for the machine from a dying Russian engineer, who denied the apparatus had any connection with quote, spiritist phenomena, describing it as something scientific, thus overtly pulling us away from turn of, turn of the century pseudosciences and toward modern science and modern SF. However, despite the Russians' photorealistic explanation that the subjects thought to create an impression on a sensitive film, 
and several more paragraphs on the emission amplification and reversion of human brain waves, the engineer's secret process for reducing wave distortion and his dramatic declaration that no human thought will remain hidden pull us back away from modern science and modern stuff again, as do the regular references to authors and works of early science fiction. Uh, Putinho initially uses the thought reading machine for direct monetary gain, getting people to think about where their ill gotten gains were hidden and then filtering them, for example. But he soon begins to use it in pursuit of social and political influence. He throws elaborate parties with a Baroque and lavish style a la Hollywood to attract the rich and powerful. The machine reveals people's true natures and reveals to him the underbelly of national politics. Mendieta describes the leadership and history of La Paz in a clear parallel to the Porfiriato and the Mexican Revolution. Quote, when the old dictator around whom swarmed a rather contemptible pseudo-aristocracy was overthrown, the new generals and ministers began to take their place. The newly elected president becomes a nouveau caudillo, and corrupt politicians fought to talk about helping the indigenous peoples and impoverished masses, yet, quote, in their private lives, they indulged in all forms of greed and profiteering. Even the issue of land reform, the centerpiece of the recent revolution, is only used as political rhetoric. Not even the middle class escape were cheap due to their role in the inefficient corruption act of bureaucracy. And the machine allows Rufino to manipulate and take advantage of them all. At this point in their dialogue, Mendieta tells Mr. X, we have schematically built our utopia of a new nation. But their critiques are much clearer and more prevalent than any plans for this utopia. There, or Caniego's creed, boils down to a condemnation of parasitism and corruption at all levels of government and society, and expressing approval of, quote, those who engage in fruitful functions, who work, who serve, who produce, who want to master the details and techniques of their trade. Whether or not this favoring of technical competence can be read as incipient support for a technocratic society, though, it becomes clearer in many of those works. La Vigilancia is the only one of Caniedo's novels to be republished. Strangely, uh, it came out in the US in early 1949 as a slightly abridged student edition of the novel, edited with an introduction, exercises, notes, and vocabulary by Virgil A. Warren, Georgetown College. Professor Warren notes the work's particular value for the U.S. college student audience because of its recent publication date and because, quote, the presentation of certain aspects of South American political life that contrast with those of our own country supplies information of great value. Warren apparently believed it was important for Spanish majors in the U.S. to understand the corrupt and inefficient nature of Latin American government. However, he appears to find Latin American perspectives on the U.S. to be less worthy of note since he carefully excises the three paragraphs at the end of chapter 15 in which the U.S. features more prominent. On page 172, the essay of the first edition, Mendieta says, Americans have all the vices of my Spanish ancestors without any of their virtues. Whereas Mendieta characterizes the Spanish as nation builders who are physically and emotionally invested in Latin America, Go, uh, for the Yankee, we are always a country to be conquered. Worse than that, a country for trade, for trafficking, a country of black or dark people who exchange precious wood for strings of beads or top hats, who hand over their petroleum, their silver and gold, and their bananas so houses can be built in Los Angeles, in Florida, or in the Scottish countryside. And so just so you can see the original that I didn't make up, there is page 172. <laughs> Despite his portrayal of the U.S. as venal and exploitative, particularly in comparison to Spain, at the same time, Mendieta repeatedly states that the thought reading machine could have been a great boon in the hands of, quote, a civilized nation, such as European countries or the U.S. In the hands of Edison, he notes, it could be used to bring progress to many to leap forward by millennia. Coutinho's misuse of the machine for personal benefit leads to his downfall. The leaders of La Paz have him killed and burned his house down, thus destroying the only prototype of the thought reading machine. Canelo's critiques of war and imperfect peace are extensive and quite bitter in this novel. Yet he frames these critiques optimistically. The title and epigraph, uh, Night Herald's Day, are taken, taken from Darío's poem, indicate from the outset a belief that the night of the Spanish Civil War and of post-revolutionary Mexico will surely give way to better things, at least someday. In the final paragraph, Scaniello also finishes on notes of hope. Of the ongoing Spanish Civil War, he writes in the voice of Mr. X, Spain burns, but it will rise again with a new body and a new spirit, and it will be as ever 
our supreme example. Not only does he represent Spain as a model for Latin American past, present, and future, he celebrates Latin America's Spanish heritage as a source of identity and strength. As Mr. X concludes, uh, I feel optimistic. I think that one day, happy generations of men will live in peace or in the past, men who will combine the immortal strength of Spain with the eternal and deep immutability of America. Um, not sure how well that has aged. <laughs> Four years later, the world is a very different place. The nationalists are firmly in control of Spain, and World War II is in its third year and has extended its reach to the Americas. In Mexico, pro Nazi and anti US sentiment are on the rise, and Pañuelo writes his second and to me most compelling novel, uh, El Preferico en San Nueve, in an effort to convince his countrymen of the dangers of supporting the access of them. He does this by writing a reconstructed biographical history of the Nazi invasion of Mexico in 1946. In 1946, the Mexican people came or will come together to fight the occupiers, which led or will lead to the current future national utopia in the 1960s. If the timeline sounds somewhat confusing, this is reflected in the various subgenre labels this book has been given over the years, the most popular being alternate history. While El Pedro Cuenta Nueva initially sounds like a classic alternate history in the Hitler wins, or in this case, Hitler invades tradition, it only qualifies as such retrospectively by us. As the Hitler wins entry in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction states, no Hitler wins tale published before Hitler actually lost World War II is an alternate history. In reality, the entry explains, the first explicit Hitler wins tales were not exercises in the reimagining of history, but dreadful warnings in the tradition of the future war tale, graphic anticipations of what might actually come to pass unless something is done. While this book is in need of warning, it also envisions or hopes for a near future utopia. As Canelo declares right after the title page, this book does not purport to be an anticipation, it is merely an optimistic book. This hopeful tone and futuristic focus is continued in the dedication of the book uh, to young people, or a mi amigo menor de 20 años, and the other half of the dedication a mi amigo norteamericano, which to my North American friends is a mystery that we back to. So this future history is the story of a time-traveling manuscript from 1961. Really, it's a found manuscript. The frame story opens in Mexico in 1938 when a petty bureaucrat visits a friend in the country. The two friends engage in vigorous criticism of the national government, much along the, the lines of La Cian Cienvia. They also talk about the probability of a European war and Hitler's trip. And then, while searching for rumored hidden treasure in the house, the man finds see an irregular gap uh, in the wall of the chimney and the stock photo type trope, if ever there was one. And in it, he finds an Excelsior newspaper dated June 11, 1961 wrapped around a manuscript dated the same the month, our novel. The manuscript is an account of the events of the European war the friends had just been predicting, including the Nazi invasion of Mexico in 1946, the eventual defeat of the Axis, and the subsequent utopian Mundo Nuevo, or New World, that emerges in Mexico. So unlike most found manuscripts, this one is from the future. In the book's epilogue, uh, we learn that the manuscript was written by Fernando, the assistant manager of a regional cooperative in the Mundo Nuevo. At the very end of the manuscript, he writes he's overcome by insecurity as to whether his account has done the event justice, so he will hide it in the pages in a chimney in hopes that someone may find meaning in them a hundred years hence. Instead, our bureaucrat finds the pages 23 years before they were written. Just how the manuscript traveled to or exists in 1938 is never explained or even addressed at all. As in La Noche Anuncia El Día, this is another case of a science fictional novum not being used particularly science fiction. Factual details are glossed over, and the novum is essentially a mechanism for demonstrating the kind of interpretation of events is right and his point repeated. The petty bureaucrat publishes some snippets of the manuscript in a magazine couched as predictions about the war in 1939, but the publication holds that only in 1943, our publication date, does an editor approach him and ask to publish the whole manuscript as an editor went that way. So, Fernando's manuscript is a history of World War II as experienced by the family of Don Rodrigo, a provincial lawyer and initially a supporter of Hitler. Rodrigo belongs to a disillusioned generation, explained Fernando. The violence, unrest, and ultimate failings of the Mexican Revolution had left the generation long for stability. One of Rodrigo's friends even longed for pre revolutionary times, saying uh, nostalgically, 
Oh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, I missed the times of Don Porfirio. Everything's so stable. The social class is so well-defined. Life so safe. Sure. Rodrigo is an ingenuous reader of Mein Kampf. He believes uh, that Hitler is a defender of religion and admires the order and discipline he has achieved in Germany. What we need here in Mexico is Hitler, he says. Another friend, Alonso, in what would seem to represent the perspective of uh, Cañedo, explains that Don Rodrigo's views are very typical among Mexican citizens. They want the Nazi triumph. They believe that the grievances that we have had with the United States since the times of Poinsett, uh, of Poinsettia of fame, will be settled to our advantage. Alonso and other friends speak against the support for the Nazis, but Rodrigo, clearly representing Cañero's target audience, is not convinced by their words. It takes the events of the German invasion and occupation to get Don Rodrigo to change his mind. German forces arrive in Mexico in 1946 under the guise of helping an ally against a dominant neighbor to the north, but the Nazi plan was really to use Mexico as a base from which to attack the U.S. At first, the Nazis successfully prey on the sympathy of, sympathies of Rodrigo's generation of Mexicans disenchanted by the revolution. But Germany has misjudged the depth of Mexico's anti-U.S. sentiment, Mexicans' commitment to Catholicism, and the peace. When Mexican citizens begin to resist Nazi dictates designed to bring them into the fold of the Third Reich, the Germans become more forceful in their methods. This unites the Mexican people against the common enemy. Whereas before national unity did not exist, we lacked unity of race, of culture, of language, of habits. In hindsight, writes Fernando, the invasion oh, uh, was a hard test for which we had to give thanks in the end. Under the Nazi boot, Mexico began its first hour as a free and united country. Except for a few quizlings who served as administrators for the German occupiers, most Mexicans soon began to support the grassroots guerrilla resistance movement. The Nazis bring the beat down harder, and among their new, more repressive measures, they confiscate the radio from Don Rodrigo's home, at which point Rodrigo called them thieves and even said that never, even from the Yankees, had Mexicans suffered such indignity. The last straw for Don Rodrigo is when the Nazis impose an arbitrary fine on him. He snaps, calls the local quizzling leader a traitor, and is put in a concentration camp. Don Rodrigo has finally changed his mind about the Nazis, but it is too late for him, and he dies in camp. His two sons follow two different paths. The younger Patricio becomes the leader of the Hitler Youth of Mexico. The elder Granicio becomes a resistance leader. This brings us back to that somewhat odd uh, dedicatoria uh, to my North American friends. As Ross Larson, that early scholar of Mexican as that writes, the United States has very few champions among the writers of Latin America. This is especially true in the case of Mexico. A notable exception is the Acompañero. From Cañedo's clear declaration of the superiority of Spanish imperialism over U.S. imperialism in La Noche de Cien Día, in Treperi, we enter a realm where an alliance with the U.S. is explicitly declared preferable to one of Germany. Ramirez Pimienta clarifies Cañedo's position on his, based on his subsequent works. Quote, more than pro-American, Cañedo was anti-Nazi. As Don Rodrigo's more enlightened friends endeavor to warn him throughout the novel, a German victory would bring greater oppression and greater erasure to Mexico. One friend tells him that a Nazi empire would mean a thousand years of oppression, of being mentally deformed from infancy, of empire, of violence, of Aryan racism. If the German government in Mexico consolidates its power, another tells him, they will anni annihilate our very essence, our Hispanicity, our Catholicism, in a word, our Latinidad. Even Don Rodrigo's quizzling son, Patricio, eventually understands how the Germans really view him and his countrymen after his German masters demand that he divorce his next Lisa wife and marry an area. The U.S. is repeatedly represented as the lesser of two evils. As Rodrigo's friends Alonso argues, although the Mexican-American War or Intervención Estadounidense in Mexico has indeed been a barbarous conquest, quote, thank God the U.S. left intact our nationality, our spiritual heritage, and also a future to shape as we saw fit. We can still be a great free nation. So the Rodrigo San Benicio, the rebel leader, allied with the United States and the U.S., is soon supplying technical support to the Mexican resistance and eventually joins the battle against Germany and Mexico. The Reconquista uh, needed to end World War II is carried out with the help of early science fiction greats, Burns and Wells. A Mexican engineer solves the German code due to cryptography training begun by reading Jules Verne. And no longer have to send the boats to uh, Washington for uh, solving. And uh, Allied air convoys are described as, quote, something out of a Wells novel. The whole world comes together in a massive effort to beat the act. Now, I don't have any pictures of Utopia, 
So here is a, a detail of the ability to manage the treatment of the bone from contest to 1934 year of the Nazi invasion of Mexico acts as a catalyst needed to finally complete the Mexican Revolution, establishing national unity and achieving a greater degree of democracy, efficiency, and equality. This time, Daniel shows us revolutionists come from the pueblo, or the people, not the politicians, and it has led to a much needed awakening uh, of a national cohesion of spirit. Clear signs of a Mexican utopia emerged in a relatively short period of time. By 1960, Mexico has made great progress towards achieving government for the people and by the people and struggles between races, classes, and religions ceased. Canedo's vision of a Mexican utopia is particularly apparent in his take on the place of science in society. In addition to a prioritized technical expertise as a condition for holding a post in the public and private sector, this future is filled with clearly beneficial new technologies and manca. In the epilogue of the novel, two leading citizens of the Mundo Nuevo debate the relative value of these technologies to the development and identity of a nation. In other words, uh, is science equal to civilization? All too often in the northern SF of this era, we see a lot of what boils down to my spaceship or my nuclear weapon, my rule. And the two men have also seen some of this in Mexico as well. For the war, one says, we thought civilization was automobiles, airplanes, aerodynamic trains, refrigerators, and the like. Even now, many people think civilization is gyro planes, track housing, new batteries, or solar energy first. But the two agree that civilization is something deeper, enumerating a higher value such as exalting our instinct for sociability, cooperation, tolerance, generosity, selflessness, the glorification of things, spirit. Here we see Cañedo bringing some of the more spiritual characteristics he associates with Mexico's Spanish heritage into the Northern equation. Uh, let us agree, the character concludes, the technology is, or may be, or, or perhaps should be, an element of civilization. But the civilization is not achieved without a base of profound collective culture. When this culture does not exist, technology leads us to barbarism. So the Latin American version of the equation would be uh, science fiction plus collective culture equal civilization. Uh, Ganeo's utopian solution for Mexico on the global stage was for Mexico to achieve full self-determination by freeing itself from external influence and to establish Mexico's international reputation, garnering recognition from the North as a power, right? Okay. The bravery of the Mexican people during their rebellion against the occupation, quote, vindicated Mexico in front of the world and washed away its fall. After the war, the U.S. has come to see Mexico as equal partners. The Americans know now that although we are different from them because our traditions draw from different sources, we are also their equals when it comes to defending the human spirit. They've also become convinced that Mexican realities are different from their own, and so we have been able to select our leaders and carve our destiny. We work together on a great task of cooperation and harmony, and spiritually, we are the leading edge of this place for civilization. Particularly in the line, uh, they've also become convinced that Mexican realities are different from their own, it is clear that Canelo is speaking out against assumptions that, all, that were all too soon to be codified in modernization theory. He denies the existence of a cookie cutter linear path post development, taking a strong position on nations turning their own routes forward that take into account diverse national histories and realities. In these lines, we certainly hear Canelo's optimism and also a smattering of the utopian universalism that is more overt in other post war utopias. As Fernando writes towards the end of his account, somewhat uh, reminiscent of La Noche Nuncia Hoy Día, formamos una humanidad mejor. We form a better humanity. We catch sight on the horizon of the white dawn. Now, I know coffee has been important, and so our time may be a little short, so I might skip over a bit. I'm just going to do it from, from his third novel, Palamante uh, TV, the show, the beginning. It should be noted that Cañedo's critiques of the failures of the Mexican Revolution and its institutionalized aftermath um, were, usually, were unusually strong and direct for the time. As Ramira Quinienta writes, while it's true that by the beginning of the 1940s, the failures of the revolution were evident, one thing was to know it, and quite another was to talk about it in so many words and to center the system in writing, as Cañedo did. It would seem clear that Cañedo's critiques of the Mexican political system and the Cuenta Nueve received some pushback since in his next book, it opens with signed preparatory remarks titled Palabras Apologeticas, or uh, Words of Apology. Here, Daniel fictitiously distances himself from the discoverers and framed narrators of his previous manuscript and from their views, 
downplaying his critiques to a certain degree. As he explains, last year I published a book that a public employee sold me that had no other merit but to say a handful of truths about our situation in the war, the Nazis, the United States, and our incomparable bureaucracy. So this is, I, I'm gonna skip and just show you pictures. This is a time travel manuscript. You can see uh, the, the spaceship is, is a silver egg type thing that you can sort of see at the top of the uh, cover of the book itself. Uh, oh, there we go. And uh, they, basically the time traveler from the future Mexico comes and notes that the, my future is utopian. Why is this reality so bad that they travel Past, and he finds uh, reasons to believe in uh, colonial history that the seeds of greatness are indeed there. There's a dedication to each wells, uh, and he comes full circle to La Noche Anunciada in his praises for uh, Mexico's Spanish heritage. Um, okay. Okay. Yes, here I am back. So Cañero's work is narratologically problematic and uneven at time. And because it hovers between generic errors, er errors in its own little wavelet of SF, it doesn't fit uh, neatly into a genre wave or moment. But his three mid-war novels bring us unexpected utopia. And he employs science fictional tropes to represent the Latin American perspective on war mm -hmm. and on peace. In his work, Cañero negotiates Mexico's place in the world. He throws off the imperial yoke from Germany, or reframes imperialist relationships as either contributing to Mexico's national character in the case of Spain, or as a potential partnership and alliances with the U.S. Nationally speaking, with La Noche Anuncia al Día and Palamas, he highlights Mexico's problems using a thought-reading machine to divine them, or by having a future citizen travel back in a time machine to point them out. Whether or not you agree with him is, of course, up to the reader. But, but he uses these novels to demonstrate the positive and ongoing contributions of Spain to Mexican identity, combined with the immortal strength of Spain, which I want to be in the of America in Noche, or to confirm the destined success of the national enterprise of us. In El Preferico de la Nueve, Daniel represents the completion of the promises of the Mexican Revolution by using external threats to force recognition of a national force of the Espíritu and achieve national unity, leading to a utopian society in the reachable future. Rebojanielo was in many ways ahead of his time. This work anticipates the representation of a Latin America as a Ciudadme, or a setting, uh, a likely setting adventure. He notes, he notes the Picaro, Molandru, a hometown character who sees through techno battle and imperialist jargon. He could certainly envision a Capitan Barbosa on the bridge of the starship. He understands the importance of solidarity and the value of the new hero, and he believes in his bones that science alone will never be enough. It's difficult to know how many Mexican writers and readers and 1950s U.S. college students have been directly influenced by Cañero's work, but he's a worthy forebear, a key example of a transitional figure in the genre of Mexico and Latin. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rachel. We'll hold our questions till the end. Sure, you're thinking of many of the audience. Okay, and our next speaker uh, is Miguel Ángel Fernández Delgado, known to us as Matt. And he was born in Mexico City and is a lawyer with degrees from the Escuela Libre de Derecho in Mexico and the University of Pisa in Italy. He studies at UNAM and the Colegio de México. He, he currently divides his time as a historian writer and art curator. Since 2013, he has been one of the two editors of Alambique, Revista Académica de Ciencia Ficción y Fantasía, which is housed at the University of South Florida. And he is also a co-owner of the bookstore Periferia that specializes in popular literary genres. Formerly a curator of the University of South Florida's Spanish language, science fiction, and fantasy special collection. He now continues this work as an advisor for the Eaton Collection at the University of California, Riverside. His work focuses on the history of science fiction, proto science fiction, and utopian thought, 
in their literary and artistic representation. He is author of Tecnología y Ciencia Ficción, Ciencia Ficción uh, 2012, and the editor of and uh, presenter of texts of Visiones Periféricas, Antología de la Ciencia Ficción Mexicana, and many others, which you can read on the website, uh, contributor in journals and chapters. And I think without further ado, uh, Miguel Angel, por favor, your title of your presentation today for us. Thank you very much, Libby. Can you hear me? Okay. Now yes. Can. I, uh, can you see my, I'm going to share my, my screen. Can you see it? Todavía no. No? <laughs> Okay, let yeah. me. Try again. Did you see it or, uh, all right? No, no, we see you. No, it's, I think it's something I'm not, uh, let me see. Oh, I forgot. Uh, yes. Yes. Technology has no no word of honor okay <laughs> this is my email no sorry don't do, don't look at that <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay it's opening now can you see it okay yes thank you very much i want to thank uh, first of all to professor stephen tobin and the and, and the department of spanish and portuguese at university of california los angeles okay latin american science fiction before the expanse of the 20th century when my interest in mexican and latin american science fiction began in the mid 1990s i only knew a few aficionados on, of this on the of the same subject in my country in 1995, I came into contact with Andrea L. Bell and about 10 years later with Rachel Haywood. In 2013, Juan Carlos Toledano and The One Who Speaks founded the Free Access Alambique Journal at the University of South Florida. Today, there are countless scholars, publications, conferences, and research centers. Before the year 2000, 19th century Latin American science fiction works were as rare as a black swan. Only 24 short stories and novels were known. Currently, thanks to the work of international researchers, there are more than 80 titles, an increase of about 70%, according to the Historia de la Ciencia Ficción Latinoamericana 2020, edited by Teresa López Pelliza and Silvia Curlat Ares. It is from this new past, so to speak, that I want, wish to depart, albeit schematically, to better understand what science fiction has been from the beginning of the 20th century until the end of the Second World War. Although it has not been possible for me to locate the enormous number of works mentioned he, uh, here, except for a few of them, I rely mainly on, in the detailed summaries and reviews by scholars to offer the panorama that follows. For this reason, my presentation should not be taken as something definitive but rather as some uh, notes to advance along the path we built together. A panorama of the 19th century. Although the short stories, novels, theater plays, and poetry from the 19th century will not be analyzed, neither their authors, we will make a review of the works and try to group them by themes in six groups. In the first, we locate three satirical and grotesque short stories inside Lucian's and Voltaire's school. A couple of short stories follow, both inspired by Richard Adams Locke's Great Moon Hoax. The third group is one of the most prolific and corresponds to Utopia. At the beginning, it develops in a very optimistic way within the Enlightenment discourse. Later, looking for alternatives in political models of nations considered more advanced and a little later, with notorious propensities towards socialist and anarchist government projects. Four, the largest group offers visions between optimistic, Faustian, or satirical, or inventions and or of ideas or notions of moral and social as well as scientific and technological progress. This same group can be classified into three more specific sections. 4.1, ironic projections of female emancipation in the future. 
4.2, representations of Darwinism ideas. 4.3, a very large group resorted as a novum to the pseudosciences in vogue in the second half of the century, such as spiritualism, magnetism, hypnosis, phrenology, theosophy, telepathy, or a mixture of them with traditional sciences. Five, there is a group in which the team takes second, second place since the main interest of their creators, its creators was to pay homage, parody, or adapt famous foreign authors. Some writers try to imitate Jules Verne, Camille Flammarion, Edgar Allan Poe, and A.G. Wells. Verne, Poe, and Wells will continue to be imitated throughout the 20th century. Finally, there are a couple of apocalyptic visions forerunners of a very, very popular team in the coming centuries. According to David Hartwell, referring to Europe and the United States, the first form of science fiction to achieve a significant impact were the 19th century utopia set in the future, since they were attractive visions of the appearance of the worlds to which social progress, progress led. At the same time, there was science fiction that dealt with scientific and technological developments, but until the end of the 19th century, it was the anticipatory visions of a social nature that had the greatest influence on popular consciousness. Something similar happened in Latin America, although with certain characteristics of its own. The utopian vision seemed to suggest that the benefits of moral and material progress would be achieved almost by the simple passage of time. Subsequently, the failure of the first government attempts ignited the imagination of some writers to offer alternative proposals, fairer and more inclusive in their opinion, creating a trend that lasted well into the 20th century. Since the 1860s, other authors preferred to imagine how science and technology innovations will transform the future, if not of the society as a whole, then at least of the privileged ones. As the fin du siècle approaches, they are increasingly pessimistic and ironic and also reflect, reflect concern about the impact that these changes will have on religion. While another group less concerned about the latter and confident in the scientism and positivism that had so much influence in, at the end of the 19th century, imagined the future and the social and individual changes that would come soon in a different way. From 1901 to 1945. Continuities. The new century changed only the numbers and dates of the calendars in most of the people and writers of our concern continue to think the same and create similar works. For the same reason, science uh, fiction followed paths very similar to those of the last century in its beginnings. Utopia added more titles, equally skeptical or dangerous views of newly introduced inventions or expected progress continued in which Darwinism notions and pseudosciences re reappeared. A curious event is that around 1910, two short stories called El Hombre Artificial were published by the Uruguayan Argentine Horacio Quiroga and the Mexican Carlos Toro. Both tell a similar tale, but Quiroga's is twice as long and, and much more complex. The creation of artificial beings continued to haunt the imagination of Latin American authors, particularly within the context of the Great War. So it happens with El Hijo del Doctor Wolfan, Un Hombre Artificial, 1917, by the Peruvian Manuel La Bedoya, published in, in Spain. In it, Fran uh, Emperor Francis Joseph I of Austria drives an army of automatons created by Dr. Wolfan, a kind of superman like those imagined by Nietzsche who do not stop only by killing the enemy troops on the battlefields. Not exactly a, a new team, but a, a novel combination was what Amado Nervo offered when giving a pair of lectures to the Mexican Society of Astronomy to talk about La Literatura Lunar y la Habitabilidad de los Satélites, 1904, in which he combined popular science and lyrical descriptions in Flammarion style. Catastrophe imaginations appear from the beginning of the century, but reach their apex around 1910 by capturing the concern that Halley's Comet aroused throughout the world. Themes and contribution of the 20th century. The first genre anthology, genre anthology. Leopoldo Lugones, Las Fuerzas Extrañas, 1906, a collection of short stories in which 
He gathered printed matter previously published in magazines and others written for it ex professo, something that had not been done before. It's important in the history of Latin American fantasy and science fiction, not only because it is the earliest among the works of Imaginación Razonada in Spanish, remembered by Borges, but for having started the process of setting most of his creations in his own time and country, creating a model to follow with, within the genre, not only in Argentina. Eucharist and anti-imperialist novels, truly original themes and not worthy variants on what was already creating in Latin American science fiction appear until the second decade of the century. In 1913, the Chilean historian Alberto Edwards published the first Eucharist, Julio Telles, the protagonist named a deputy of Chiloé's island, south of Chile, described as the South American Napoleon and creator of the Pacific Confederation with which he seeks the, uh, the economic and political independence of the region to remove, above all, the meddling of the United States. Another Ukraine is Mexico in 1935, El Presidente Vasconcelos, 1929, by the Ecuadorian Cesar Emilio Arroyo, published in Paris, in which he uh, describes what could have been the government of his friend, the Mexican politician Jose Vasconcelos. Thematically related to Alberto Edwards' short story are the Central American anti-imperialist novels. The first one is El Problema, 1899, by the Guatemalan Maximo Soto Hall. Although his position is equivocal, without clearly pronouncing himself in favor or against the U.S. intervention. But it is clearly manifested in La Caída del Águila, 1920, by the Costa Rican Carlos Gagini, who, after models of Bernian characters such as Robur and Captain Nemo, imagines the engineer Roberto Mora, creator and director of the Knights of Liberty, an international secret society in a near future in which all of Central America has been colonized by the United States. Through alliances with Japan and other countries, Mora manages to organize a powerful army to defeat the Americans and later other, other European powers to create a new world order. Halfway between Ukraine and anti-imperialist literature is the Cuban Juan Manuel Planas' La Corriente del Golfo, 1920, set in 1895. Probably inspired by Jules Verne, L'Invasion de la Mer, 1905, he suggested the construction of a gigantic dam to divert the Gulf Stream in order to harm Europe and to force Spain and other countries to recognize the country's independence. Subtle invasions. In a pair of short stories by the Mexican Julio Torri, La Conquista de la Luna and Era un País Pobre, both from 1917, he criticizes the American cultural influence and also the growth of machinism of machinism in society. The Venezuelan Julio Garmendia does the same in Una Visita al Infierno, 1917, where he shows what could be expected in an increasingly mechanized world. An ambiguous position regarding material progress was that of the Mexican Martin Luis Guzman. While visiting New York, he wrote journalistic articles condemning the technological progress he observed, but became fond of typewriters since they seem to him instruments capable of creating melodies in accordance with the rhythm of life and new urban sounds. Perhaps by typing, he was inspired to describe an electronic brain that, pre that predicts in, uh, a world catastrophe at the end of the Great War. The interest in new technologies promoted the appearance of books and especially magazines aimed at amateurs even in Latin America. Modern Electrics, 1908 through 1914 by Hugo Hernsback was the first to cross borders. In 1909, Hernsback pointed out that Mexico was the third country after the, after the United States and England with the highest numbers of subscribers. It is necessary to write about Mexico, a study like the one Beatriz Sarlo dedicated to these publications in Argentina and their impact on the imagination and the idea of modernity. However, Mexican professor Alberto Oliva published Fantasías Divulgación Científica in 1921, where he interspersed technical information and his cosmogonic ideas about the universe governed mainly by electromagnetic forces to narrate the expedition of some Mexican compatriots to the moon. 
during World War II was published in Argentina, a novel about an expedition to Saturn, Saturn in a rocket ship built with state-of-the-art technology, El Interplanetario Atomico, 1945 by Alberto Brun, another book with diagrams and technical illustrations. The second genre anthology, another Latin American writer that deserves more attention is the Venezuelan Julio Garmendia, author of La Tienda de Muñecos, 1927. His short story, Cuando Pasen Tres Mil Años Mal, Mas, 1923, could be the first to make an obvious political criticism to his country, of his country through science fiction. In the year 4923, in the ruins of a temple, they discovered the remains of a warrior leader of the uh, late 21st century. The interdisciplinary study of the place paves the way for Auguste Comte's sociology to better interpret the archaeological find. In what Carlos Sandoval considers a critique of the theory of Cesarismo Democrático developed by the positivist sociologist Laureano Vallenilla Lanz in 1919, from which the Juan Vicente Gomez dictatorship 1908 through 1935 was given ideological support. If we leave aside the utopias of the past, symptoms of discomfort with the, the political situation of their time, also without their direct attacks or criticism of specific people, Garmendia's short story makes a subtle but direct criticism of the regime in which we live, he lived. One of Garmendia's best-known short stories, La Realidad Circundante, 1927, about the invention of a device that allows, quote, la verdadera adaptación científica a la vida real, unquote, seems to be inspired by the cultural lag theory de developed in 1922 by sociologist William F. Ogburn. A variety of dystopias. Dystopias, except for some poetic intuitions, uh, such as Futura, 1892, by the Colombian Jose Asuncion Silva, began to appear so repetitiously in the 1920s. In 1923, Paraguayan liberal author Carlos Frutos published Los Cuervos de Icaria about an island where their, their inhabitants turned their back to progress and preferred to live governed by caudillos. While the Argentinian Miguel A. Calvo Rosellor published the short story Un País Extraño, 1925, in which he describes a communist society as a poor government, and the Peruvian Angelica Palma portrays a government of the year 3025 in El Último Poeta, 1924, which resembles the Soviet model. The Mexican journalist and politician Felix F. Palavicini published Castigo, novela mexicana de 1945-1926, where, repeating the political drama of 19th century, he does not know if it is best to copy the American or the Soviet model of government, since both failed to, uh, after adapting them to his country. This political duality also appears allegorically in a short story from the same year, La Doble y Unica Mujer, by the Ecuadorian Pablo Palacio, who represents in a Siamese woman the political social struggle unleashed by the Revolución Juliana. Between critic and satirical is the Fragmento de una Carta de Caracas, escrita en el año 1975, 1925, by the Venezuelan Blas Millán, by imagining a society in which women carry out the activities considered male and men are dedicated to literature. It is also skeptical on female emancipation, the Peruvian José Ruiz Guidobro in Un Suicidio, Cuento Futurista, 1926, set in the Soviet Union of the future, full of technological advances and free women. Women's liberation and birth control are seen, although not clearly as dystopias, since Cuban Eduardo Orsay's novel Eugenia Esbozo Novelesco de Costumbres Futuras, 1919, where he addresses eugenics as a state policy, collective marriages, and ectopic pregnancy of men. Later, in Puerto Rico, Alfredo Collado Martel writes the short story Un Buen Hombre Que Fue Un Hombre Malo, 1931, where he, use, uh, where he uses in, uh, insemination and other artificial reproduction techniques to offer a parable of imperialism. El Regreso de Eva, 1933, by the Venezuelan Federico León Madrid, depicts a state government where women predominate and men are enslaved. More conciliatory is Timor, 1932, by an utopia by the Chilean Manuel Astica, which imagines a socialist regime in mythical Lemuria, where men and women alternate in power. Some utopias. 
Unlike the utopias of the past, those of the 20th century incorporate elements of race and, at times, a greater emphasis on economic development. Perhaps inspired by the failed attempt to establish Fortlandia in the middle of the Amazonian jungle, Terra Firme, Nove Tierra Firma Novela Futurista, 1927, by the Chilean, uh, Chilean R.O. Land, tells the story of a successful mining project that allowed the founding of a utopian city, Puerto Urano, in the island of Huemul, where a collectivist regime is established that allows the growth uh, of the entire region and even the manufacture in Chile of the fourth Nepos car. Another utopia from the same country is, is Ovalle, El 21 de Abril del año 2031, 1933, by David Perry, in which a fakir leads the protagonist to a wonderful society of the 21st century where the teachings of the Buddha are followed. There are a couple of representative utopias of Latin America in our period. The first one is La Raza Cosmica, 1925, by the Mexican Jose Vasconcelos, written in, a, in the form of an essay proposing the, uh, the Latin American Union and the mix, mixture of all races. The second is Indoamerica en el año 3580-1940, by the Peruvian Jose Montenegro Vaca, also written as an essay although it imagines the warlike interference of extraterrestrials in the future. It presents a socialist government in harmony with nature and among races of the American continent, endorsing radical indigenism proposals. Other utopias incorporating lost worlds come next. Lost worlds. Some national stories or legends, such as El Dorado, shared by several countries in South America, Montezuma's treasure in Mexico or Sebastianism in Brazil have nurtured stories about lost worlds and secret places, which have an echo in science fiction of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Ross Larson located one of them in Mexico, in El Nuevo Aztlán, 1949, by Maria de Lourdes Hernández, but it was in Chile that the legend of the city of the Caesars created almost a small subgenre that began at the end of the 19th century and finished in the 1930s. The unfinished novel Los Monos Enloquecidos, 1931, by the Ecuadorian José de la Cuadra, comes near the Lost World topic. A businessman creates an industry in the jungle until he learns of the legend of a treasure and subjects the monkeys to experiments to turn them into workers capable of assisting him better than human beings. The Guatemalan Rafael Arevalo Martinez published two utopian novels, El Mundo de los Maharachías, 1938, and its sequel, Viaje a Ipanda, 1939, in which human beings coexist with intelligent primates in the conformation of a social democratic utopia. Qualms of the Century. Even in one of his last short stories, El Sexto Sentido, 1918, Amado Nervo showed optimism towards the scientific and technological novelties of the new century. But starting in the 1930s, examples appear that show attitudes close to schizophrenia. As can be found in some of the short stories collected by the Ecuadorian Humberto Salvador in Taza de Te, 1932, and Antonio Asido una Hyperbole, 1932, by his compatriot Jorge Fernandez. Noteworthy is the novel Barranquilla, 2132, 1932, by the Colombian Jose Antonio Osorio Lizarazo, a parody of Buck Rogers in the 25th century, in which the protagonist, Al Rogers, thanks to suspect, suspended animation, wakes up in the 30, 23rd century, but finds a world that discourages him to the point of choosing suicide. La próxima historia que pasó en cierto tiempo más, 1934, by the founder of uh, creationism, Vicente Huidobro, is the story of Alfredo Rock, who flees from the problems of common life and founds a colony in Angola, which prospers until the outbreak of World War. Some colonies blame the machines and destroy them. Alfredo believes, despite everything, that Russia will be the last hope of humanity. Mechanical desolation. Linked to the previous theme are the signs of fear and resignation for loss of for the loss of human condition in the face of progress. Confidencias de un automobilista refinado, 1929, by the Venezuelan Blas Millán, is the story of a man who falls in love with, with his car. Neo Centauro, 1932, by the Mexican Jose Martinez Sotomayor and La Máquina Humana, now 1940, by the, his compatriot Bernardo Ortiz de Montellano, referred to the sy uh, symbiosis between men and machines. 
futures in, futures in which human beings lo lose, lose their best feelings appear in uh, another short story by Ortiz de Montellano, Sank Aux Sans Coeur, 1940, a portrait of a time when people only live a few hours in which they must try to know all vital experiences, and in 32.504.007, 1920, by the Uruguayan Adolfo Montiel Ballesteros, where after a long time in which human beings have been born without the heart, one is born with it, a phenomenon that makes him a rarity before the others and is the cause of his unhappiness. Troca el Poderoso. Until now, the robot figure had, uh, has been used as a symbol of development that is out of control and or as an affront to the laws of God or nature. However, in the 1930s, the governments of socialist ideology in Mexico had the idea of using it as an emissary of desired progress. That is how Troca el Poderoso was born, first on a radio show in 1932, where he explains to children the great advances of the time, transforming himself into different mechanisms. And seven years later, the writer Germán Liz Tarzubide was asked to write his adventures, accompanied by attractive illustrations, in which the order, in, the order includes a presentation explaining the advent of a new era as a paraphrase of Genesis. Kant philosophics. Voltaire's idea on conceiving the Kant philosophics was to forget aesthetic delight and chain events into a coherent plot in order to achieve a self-evident moral. In this way, it was possible to dispatch institutions, individuals, or situations so that intelligent people would understand them. The first examples, sorry, the first Examples of such works in Latin America were sim simple imitations of the French philosopher, but already in the 20th century, they reached a higher degree of sophistication. El Vertigo, 1916, by the Bolivian Adela Zamudio, has been described by Giovanna Rivero as the allegory of a cricket's journey through the, uh, the caverns of a human skeleton, in which it must face and overcome social and power hierarchies until a, a concierge leads it to the place from where they communicate with the outside, represented as a complex telephone exchange. Some have compared it to Borges' El Aleph, 1945, and Rivero suspects that it may be a reflection of the Federal Revolution of 1898. Una triste aventura de 14 sabios, 1928, novel by the Colombian José Félix Fuenmayor, tells the, uh, the journey of some scientists outside Earth, while the planet, due to a strange gravitational phenomenon caused by a comet, increases its size and that of all the, its inhabitants. The wise men return to study Earth and the new Earthlings from their various fields of expertise, thus creating a fable of the myopia of scientific work. El Pozo, 1936, by the Bolivian Augusto Céspedes, is a short story of some soldiers who, who must dig for water. The work becomes more laborious than expected and forces the soldiers to face different setbacks that make them question what they are doing without realizing that they have reached another dimension. Rivero considers it a parable of the Chaco War between Bolivia and Paraguay. Borges and Company. Since the end of the 1930s, Borges dedicated himself to vindicate some popular genres, particularly cr uh, crime fiction. In his prologue to his friend Adolfo Bioy Casares, La Invención de Morel, 1940, he also proposed to prize what he called the Obras de Imaginación Razonada. Bioy's novel, on the other hand, is the most important published in this period. In the 1940s, Borges began to publish some of the short stories and anthologies that would make him world famous. This is not the place to discuss whether or not he wrote science fiction. We simply copy Silvia Ares' work, quote, La sagacidad de Borges es hacer que sus textos de CF puedan ser leídos como otra cosa, unquote. Also in 1940, along with Bioy and Silvina Ocampo, Borges edited the Antología de la Literatura Fantástica, 1940, second and large edition, 1965, a work ha that has not been generally been given the uh, due importance. And I realized this after reading the book you, you can see on the cover. The following paragraph taken from a review by, of the Mexican poet Javier Villaurrutia, precisely from 1945, explains it better. 
el primer conjunto de textos que forman ficciones, el jardín de senderos que se bifurcan y que aparece en un volumen independiente, al tiempo que apareció la singular fantasía de Adolfo Bio y Casares, la invención de Morel, me llevó a pensar que mientras otras literaturas hispanoamericanas, sin descontar la nuestra, fatigan sus pasos en el desierto de un realismo y de un naturalismo áridos y secos, monótonos e interminables, la literatura argentina presenta ante nuestros ojos no un espejismo, sino un verdadero oasis para nuestra sed de literatura de invención. The summary of Latin American science fiction reveals that the first part of the 20th century began with Lugones' decision to gather his fiction between the covers of a book so that in a manner, manner of speaking, they would form part of the history of national literature. Latin Americans so attached to the past discovered in Ukraine the possibility of recreating history in another way and of seeking justice in the court of the imagination. They did the same with anti-imperialist literature and above all by using science fiction to criticize adverse regimes. They imagined more utopias incorporating race and local traditions and refused to accept easily the novelties of the century. After the modernism writers who experimented with science fiction, Nervo, Lugones, Quiroga, Palma, it began to be cultivated occasionally by other notable writers, mostly from the artistic avant-garde like Alberto Edwards, Jose Félix Fuenmayor, Vicente Guidobro, and Jorge Luis Borges. Finally, I reiterate the celebration of the growth of our field of study and suggest that in, the, in future research, Latin American countries with, in which Spanish is not the official language, especially Brazil, be considered as well since the, their production is extensive and offers similarities with the rest of Latin America. Thank you. Okay, so we can open the floor to questions and um, uh, and then if uh, David Dalton, you're just changing your seat or you're asking. Oh, I'm coming up, which is fine. Okay, Here. come up and talk. Okay. Um, so I had, a, I had a few questions, uh, Rachel. Maybe we'll just talk about questions at lunch because I love that novel and it's, you know, I now know there's a person I can talk to about that novel, <laughs> which I didn't know before. Um, I'll sit down so that you can see my face, Miguel. Uh, so the question that I had for you, Miguel, actually had to do with, uh, with the genre, with genre in science fiction, but now I'm talking about genre as in like um, outside of narrative, are there, have, there, have you, are you familiar with um, kind of science fiction texts that, that have been um, produced outside of, outside of narratives, so like theater or film, I mean, film we know a lot about. Um, you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned La Raza Cosmica, which is an essay, um, but I was just wondering if you could kind of speak to what has and has not been done in that area. I'm sorry, can you repeat the, the, the question? Maybe a little closer. I, I, I have to, to cut the, the because can I you, have uh, some... Can you hear me better now? Yes. You... Okay. Um, so I was, my question had to do with, um, had to do with uh, genre or media, right? Uh, having to do with what are some, uh, what, are you familiar with science science fiction texts, especially um, kind of earlier ones, right? Uh, that aren't narratives. So I, I mentioned cinema, but I also mentioned theater, for example. And then I said, you know, you did mention La Raza Cosmica, which was which is an essay. And so I was just kind of wondering what's been done, what hasn't, uh, looking at science fiction beyond narrative in this history. Sorry, but I, I can't understand. Do, do you want uh, names of particular works? Uh, um, I'm just interested in kind of where the field is at this moment, or what you what you're familiar with at this moment. Beyond beyond narrative, there might not be much. Okay, uh, poetry, um, uh, poetry and theater. It's uh, the main, as far as I. Uh, uh, I've read the, are the, the most important topics being researched at, for, at the present. Elton Honorius is working very much on, on the topic of theater. Uh, I'm, I'm working on poetry. 
but also I'm working, uh, also trying to to do research uh, combining uh, Bras Bras Brazilian culture with Latin uh, the, the rest of Latin American countries. Brazil is also a Latin, Latin American country, but uh, and I, I and I, I've, I've been finding a lot of uh, important similarities in in Brazil cinema with Mexican cinema of uh, the 1950s and 60s, and also until the 1970s. I'm working with this with Alfredo Supia, uh, a scholar that you most of you must know, and but. I think poetry has uh, hasn't been given the the importance that it has, because there's a saying in Mexico, but that I think it's it's uh, applicable to most of Latin America, uh, that if you move an, a, a stone, you can find more poets than spiders under the the, the stone. So <laughs> it's there are. Uh, and most most of the writers, even when they are not professionals, even when they are not great writers, like to write uh, poetry to express their their feelings. So we we have to, especially women, also especially women, uh, we have to to study more, take more into account poetry. And the Ecuadorian uh, chapter of the Historia de la Ciencia Ficción Latinoamericana uh, is a very very fond, very makes a, a, a takes very much into account uh, poetry that I, I like that that uh, that uh, chapter because of that thank you thank you that was a great answer anyone else emily and then Gabriela, and then we can go to chat if necessary Do anyone have a question question <laughs> so <laughs> I, I have a question for both Rachel and Miguel Angel, and, and this has been such a fantastic panel because working on things that are very contemporary, there's so much that I don't know about uh, fin de siglo and, and things co coming after. So I'm curious, um, thinking both about the, the specif specificity of, of Rachel's talk and and the, the panorama that you give us, Miguel Angel, about how how much and in what ways these texts traveled across borders? That is, is this, are these, I mean, we're talking about multiple moments here, right? Being this say low early 20th century and, and the, the World War II post-war years, but, but to what extent are these authors in dialogue with, with folks just in, you know, Mexico or just in Argentina or Chile? And to what extent are these texts circulating, whether it's in journals or, or through correspondence? I was, I mean, I was struck by the, the quote from Urrutia at the, at the end, um, but I'm interested in sort of thinking about networks. Well, Rachel, you can, you want to answer first? Um, I, I was frankly shocked that at the translation of the, well, not the translation, the edition of the, the text that I was working with. I mean, I, my first answer about, I, I want to know what Ian Ockham has to say, but my first answer, you know, until the internet, things aren't crossing borders fairly much. And, you know, Akson has made a big effort with it. Um, uh, and has made a difference. But um, I, I got talked to the Yanka many times when I, especially when I was working on Masasha on the magazine, they have an advertising page and list all of the different countries where it's supposedly for sale and it includes Mexico as many and the others in the Yanka. You know, I've never seen this in Mexico. And so you, you wonder how much of it is realistic. And you also look at the section of the letters for readers and where they were from. And, you know, someone is from Russia, but it's in Puerto Diego. So, you know, was he, you know, was it, it was, that was more of a one-off. You're not getting a lot of readers and in the letters, you know, outside of the greater Buenos Aires area. So clearly Northern science fiction is traveling south 
is let how widely is the Latin American science fiction being read within the country, depending on how it was labeled and what year it was, and also among other countries. Uh, it, it still feels pretty limited, but I'm hoping that Miguel Ancro has better news. Yes, uh, I want to. Yes, there are, we need to study more the criticism on, on, on our science fiction and also uh, to explore which uh, works were the best, the first best, best, uh, best sellers, like Dr. Wolfan, which uh, the novel that has been, all, uh, been uh, published in a new edition with an an uh, essay by Elton Honores in 2017 in Peru. And also to study which works were translated. The first one which was translated, I didn't tell this, I, it ha I had it in my first draft, but I, I cut it out because of the, uh, for the lack of time. It was uh, Leon Fernandez Guardia, uh, the Costa Rican uh, short story, El it's the number, it, the, the title of the short story is uh, the number of one, el, el, el del cuarto en trece, algo así. No recuerdo el título. I lo, I'm looking for it, but I, I can't find it. But it, it was translated in 1925 in, in a short story, uh, sorry, in a, uh, not a very known publication in the United States by the Carnegie Foundation of, for Peace or something. And I, I thought the first one was uh, El Jorge Luis Borges, El Jardín de Senderos que se bifurcan, which was translated in 1948 by Anthony Boucher at, uh, and published in uh, Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. I thought it was the first one, but uh, Ivan Molina, uh, the scholar from Costa Rica, uh, told us that uh, though it was the first one, as far as, as we have uh, the research has told us is the, this one. Uh, by uh, Leon Fernandez Guardia. And what, yes, we must also to, to risk, do more research on the contacts between the modernists uh, who most of them get to know each other in, in, in Paris during one of the world ex expositions in 1900, Nervo, uh, Darío, where all, all of them there, they, they were there. And the, some, well, I, I, I don't know if I can answer uh, an, uh, a question from the public by Jorge Maturano. Oh yeah, that's the question. I sure. But just in order to read that so other people okay. can see it. Um, since you have done so much research on, and it, this relates to what you were just talking about with the, the modernists, since you have done so much research on the production of science fiction with a historical perspective, I want to know your perspective about in what ways science fiction has influenced the literary system, Sistema Literaria at large. And second, what interesting experiment with language in any of these works would you like to highlight? Thank you, but uh, I think, I don't know if the first, uh... Question, I, I I don't know how to answer it, but I don't know if Rachel has, a, but I have a question, uh, an answer for the second question. There's an experiment. There's a, a very rare, not a very uh, good uh, novel in Mexico called El Extraterrestre Purépecha by uh, um, an author of, uh, from Michoacán, in the state of Michoacán in Mexico, which uh, represents an extraterrestrial who comes to Mexico and is very fond and uh, some kind of anthropologist or something that it's uh, gets to know it's very familiar with the Poripecha or the Tarascan uh, culture and is and, and it, it, it he identifies himself as a Poripecha and there are also many wor words from this uh, dialect uh, from the Purépecha, the, the Michoacan original language. It's, a, the, the, it's the one that I remember. I don't know if Rachel can, uh, uh, wants to give another answer. Oh, I, the first part of the question, the second part of the question, words that... Oh, the second part of the question was how language, um, what interesting experiment with language 
in any of these works would you like to highlight? No, I'll keep thinking about it, yeah. but um, okay. fiction tends to be very plot driven. Uh, and plus, you know, the relationship between high literature, low literature, and experimental mm -hmm. literary experiments is something perhaps David wants to pronounce. Mm -hmm. It depends on what. It depends on what they mean by by language experiments, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I heard that question, I immediately thought of the novel Su Nombre Era Muerte by Rafael Bernal, where there's a where there's a culturally mestizo person who goes among the Yucatecan, I believe. It's been years since I read it, populations in uh, Merida or in Yucatan. And he he looks at how the he looks at the indigenous flutes, right? And he makes one that makes him communicate with mosquitoes. And he finds out that mosquitoes are the dominant species in on Earth, and that they've actually kind of installed humans, right, to kind of be things to drink blood from. And then there's like some sort of it's been a while, but there's like these this whole connection to like the human sacrifices and pulling out hearts and blood and mosquitoes and yeah. So I, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind for me is kind of cross-species communication, but I don't know if that's what they were going for with the question. Mm, that cross, yeah, I, I got, that's in chapter one too. Oh, yeah. Cross-species cross communication or lack thereof, mm -hmm. uh, right. depending on it. But, um, and in terms of what way science fiction has influenced the literary system is the other part of the question. Um, in the time periods that that I work with, it's it's more we're still talking more ghettoization or when people write about the works, there's you always find the tendency someone who's found the narrowest, strangest definition of science fiction to prove that the work that they're writing about isn't science fiction. It's something a little bit more uh, acceptable in the in the Canon. And the canon in, in academia, uh, so it's fantastic literature or it's magic realism. I mean, Ursula Le Guin wrote ages ago mm -hmm. that we call magic realism uh, fictions that we approve of. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that has happened, you know, especially in uh, among Latin American critics. Um, but it, it all depends. The very earliest stuff wasn't published as science no. fiction. So that, that's sort of what my book project is about, you know, how science fiction becomes a self-conscious genre. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the future chapters after this initial prequel one are talking about sort of the births of fandom in different countries. Mm -hmm. And you can get them at vastly different times. And I'm always like picking the Yanakin's brain on this. Because like, you know, Masaj, I was in the 50s. Are you sure it's not in Mexico? And he's like, no, Mexico, 1960s, look at this. And so you have, you know, disparate years and decades when different things are going on in different places, which sort of adds more to the disconnect theory in answer to Elvis's question. Can I just intervene that this is something Maela Gonzalez said in her article on cyberpunk that the publishing, the nature of publishing in Latin America, there are not pulp. So writers experimented freely, including Machado de Assis in the 19, mm -hmm. uh, 19th century. And so he wrote about automatas, he wrote about time travel, he wrote about all these things, and they were all published in Foyetin. And so, you know, there have been, I've written articles on this, and I've compared Mexico and Brazil historically, and I would like to see uh, sort of narrative uh, history of this earlier period mm -hmm. by mostly concentrating on, on the later stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is very exciting uh, research. And, and there, there's a, a gold mine for whoever mm -hmm. wants to uh, get their pickaxe out and, mm -hmm. and work on it, including Miguel Angel, obviously. So, Question. Okay, really well, just the name of an question, author. Because we're waiting on lunch. You missed the whole lunch. Yeah. <laughs> what was the name of the author for the El Presidente Vasconcelos? I, I missed that. Yes, to me. Cesar Arroyo. Cesar Arroyo? Thank you. Oh, I wrote Jose Monument. No, Cesar. Cesar Emilio Arroyo. Muy bien. Gracias. <laughs> and then Miguel, Miguel Garcia, who has been there, he 
he pointed this uh, novel to me and, and sent me an, uh, a copy. Thank you, Miguel. <laughs> yeah, so we can see that there is a lot of collaboration and a lot goes into all this, and I'll be talking about that later tonight. Um, I want to make... Oh, yes, we had a... Gabriela, you were here. Yes, yes. Sorry, uh, I think there are a few questions, but I, I think it will be quick. Um, what does the name of El Referi Cuenta Nueve, it's a very strange name. Do you have an interpretation for uh, the name? Because, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, you know, I think it's never mentioned in the book, and it's such mm -hmm. a dis distinctive title. And so, is it's, it from boxing? It is. I from think boxing. it is. But well, Miguel Angel told me it's from boxing, and it completely makes sense to me because it's, uh, it, it's, you know, we're losing time. We're yes, losing time right. supporting the Germans start realizing, you know, where your interests lie. Mm -hmm. But I, it's such, I, I just wish he'd done something for, with the title of the book. Yes, right. yes. I mean, the other, the other case, the first case is so clear. I mean, it's from Dario, his title. And the last case, it's the names of the people. Oh, el agua asfaltado, so it's talking about uh, el agua texcoco and the and modern city and building over things. And other titles are so referential. And this one sticks in your head. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think, it, it, because it's not anywhere, it's, I, I, I need to fit fit it in somewhere, yeah. but it sort of suspends, yeah. you know, we have this second of time to change, yeah. change things. And in the context, I think it was more clear for, for the people who read it, I, I guess. So the other one, um, the name of, of the person who wrote the Utopia uh, from in, um, like an indigenous Utopia, I missed it. So if you can repeat it, Miguel Angel, please. And the other question that Miguel Angel was saying about we have to research um, in trying to look or to, to find more women. I, I want to ask you about Asuncion Izquierdo Albiñana, which I have, um, I have been referenced as uh, um, speculative fiction, I know, retro labeling, but with um, Andreida. Yeah, eh, Andreida El Tercer Sexo and Los Extraordinarios, which I've heard it has a supercomputer on it. So um, I think it's uh, interesting if you know something about her. Um, I think uh, we, um, Andreida is very interesting because it, she is speculating with the idea of the new women and it's, well, new woman, the new standard very modern and very like the the flapper and the consequences of the flapper, but okay. And the last one, <laughs> it's about estridentismo. I, I think it has a very contemporary resonances. Do you have any thoughts on that about the estridentismo? Let's see about high, low, little. Yeah. Very. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh... I'm also working on Manuel Maple Sarce. I, I just found his uh, legal, the, his law degree thesis, <laughs> full of neologisms, and we we are going to give a little uh, conference on on Maple Sarce. In, I don't, I'm not sure if in December or January because he was also a lawyer from my school, the Escuela Libre de Derecho. Uh, the the, nom, the name of the utopia is Indo America in the year 3580 by the Peruvian uh, Peruano Jose Montenegro Vaca, and it was written by the the same publishers of the magazine Indo America, which uh, members uh, exiled members from the Peruvian APRA uh, uh, political party APRA. Uh, which were living in Mexico at the time, Jose Montenegro Vaca. And the other utopias, I'm not, I'm not familiar with uh, any of them. So I, I don't think, uh, I don't know if Rachel. Would she publish by Andreida? Well, it's like kind of speculative fiction, but uh, written in, Andreida was written in 1939. And uh, Los Extraordinarios, which I think was her last novel. And what and is her name? Asuncion Izquierdo Albiñana, but that's a, um, a pen name because she 
she wrote as with many pen names, many different pen names to hide herself from her husband. <laughs> yeah. There's one called Ahainya Duit Nortu, which is the queen of the unknown, I guess, in Brazil, which is late 19th century, and it's a fantasy and speculates about women and love and, you know, another reality. That's another one, but it's a good one. Thank you. Well, there's lots to do. Thank you, so <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. We have a lot to talk about. I was going to ask about me feel fun, but there's another time for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Live long and prosper. Thank <laughs> you.